Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The sun had just dipped below the skyline in the town of Madison, New Jersey. Along Fairview Avenue, the street was already soaked in deep shadows by 5.30 in the evening. It was the woods that made the street so dark. The tall trees and the thick underbrush of what everyone called Cluxon's Woods loomed over the roadway. It would have made the journey of the young girl who was walking next to them an eerie one if she had not made the same trip so many times before. Jeanette Lawrence, who lived with her parents at 142 Ridgedale Avenue, a house directly across the street from Cluxon's Woods, was on her way home. She had been babysitting for a couple of hours at the home of the James A. G. Sant family at 19 Fairview Avenue. It was a regular job for her, and she adored four-year-old Madeline Sant, with whom she would spend many afternoons. Each day, Jeanette had walked along this same stretch of road, past this same patch of woods, but this day would be different. Jeanette, a seventh-grade student at the Green Avenue School, was a pretty girl, tall for the age of eleven, with light brown hair and a luminous smile. She was caring, smart, and very responsible, which was why she was so in demand by neighbor families to watch after their children when they were away. On this particular day, October 6, 1921, she had just left the Sant house and was on her way home. Mrs. Mary Friedlander, a neighbor, saw her waving goodbye to little Madeline at 5.35 p.m. Janet passed Mary's house with a short wave and then continued on down the street. This was another ordinary occurrence. Janet was a friendly, polite girl and always had a smile for friends and neighbors. It was a chilly afternoon, and Jeanette buttoned up her coat as she walked. She carried her school books with her. She had hurried to Mrs. Sant's house to watch Madeline after school, and she had some homework that still needed to be finished. As she was walking, she heard the clear ring of a bicycle bell behind her. She looked back and saw her friend Bertha Crane riding in her direction. Bertha grinned as she got close and slowed down, I've got something to tell you, she called out to Jeanette. Can you stop by? I can't, Jeanette replied. I've got to hurry home. I'll see you tomorrow at school then, Bertha said, and rode off in the direction of her house. Jeanette waved and continued walking. She was almost home, but she never got there. Bertha turned out to be the last person, except for her killer, to ever see Janet Lawrence alive. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, it's a chapter from the audiobook Suffer the Children – American Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings by Troy Taylor. The chapter is entitled 1921 Murder at Cluxon's Woods, a murder that has yet to be officially solved, although many hundreds of people in the area feel they know exactly who got away with murder, a murder that resulted in a haunting. I've narrated the entire Suffer the Children audiobook, and it's extremely dark. I'll leave a link in the episode description to it. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Anyone who grew up in northern New Jersey in the first half of the 20th century was probably familiar with the Cluxon Winery. The winery, founded by a German immigrant named Francis Cluxon, began operations in 1865. It survived prohibition by producing sacramental wines for Catholic and Episcopal churches across the country. In 
but by the early 1970s, its glory days were over, when the winery at 28 Fairview Avenue in Madison was torn down to make way for new homes the demolition became a major event in the area. The winery had been standing for nearly a century. The large, vine-covered structure had been located near Francis Cluxon's Fairview Avenue home. For many decades, there was a section of woods on the grounds of Cluxon's estate that was bordered on the south by Fairview Avenue and on the west by Ridgedale Avenue. The locals called it Cluxon's Woods, and the children from the neighborhood often played there including his son, Francis Jr., and his grandson, Francis III. When Cluxon died in May 1914, the area newspapers published long, glowing obituaries, praising his many civic and political contributions to the community. By that time, one of his two sons, Herman, was running the winery, and his other son, Francis Jr., his wife Kate, and his son, Francis III, were living in the house at 28 Fairview Avenue. They were the most influential family in the area. The success of the winery had spread the Cluxon name throughout the United States, but it was Cluxon's woods, and not their fine wines, that made newspaper headlines in the fall of 1921. What happened in the woods remains one of the most chilling, unsolved cases in the history of New Jersey murder. It was on October 6, 1921, that Janet Lawrence vanished while walking home past Cluxon's Woods. The last person to see her was her friend Bertha Crane, but it's possible that her mother heard the last sounds that Janet ever made. The young girl had been nearly home when Bertha left her, and just moments later, Janet's mother, Rosetta, reported later that she'd heard an unusual cry, a kind of gurgle in the fading light of the day. She said that it sounded like a child in convulsed laughter, but was it the sound of Rosetta's daughter or her killer? A few minutes later, Jeanette's 15-year-old brother Edson came into the house and asked where his sister was. It was getting late, and he offered to walk her home if she was still babysitting. Rosetta told him to go to the Sant's house and see if Jeanette was still there. After Edson left, Rosetta became worried it was unlike Jeanette to be so late getting home. After pacing the kitchen for a few minutes, she finally went out and stood on the sidewalk and called Jeanette's name. There was no reply. When Edson returned and told her that Jeanette had left for home nearly an hour before, panic set in, and the search began in earnest. Neighbors joined in, and the police were contacted. Madison Police Chief Fred R. Johnson, along with Lt. William J. Ryan, arrived around 7 p.m. By then, it was dark. At 7.30, two teenage neighbors of the Lawrences, Walter Schultz and Chauncey Griswold, both Boy Scouts with experience in the forest, found Janet's lifeless body in Cluxon's woods. She was lying near the stump of a large tree. A number of trees had recently been cleared for a new street through the woods, and the stump was along a rough trail that the contractors had cleared. Jeanette was lying on blood-soaked grass. She had been stabbed 23 times. A large handkerchief was tied around her neck, and her hands were tightly tied behind her back with cord. Her dress was gathered around her waist, and her underclothes had been pulled down to her ankles. Some of the stab wounds had torn through her clothing, but others had not, suggesting that some of the stabbing followed or accompanied the rape. The deepest wound penetrated her stomach and perforated her kidney. She had also been knifed in the throat, and according to the Newark pathologist, her death had been caused by the severing of the blood vessels in her neck. When word spread about the murder, the residents of Madison were outraged. This was an unspeakable crime against a young girl and could not be tolerated in the upscale, industrious community that the people believed their city was. The sordid rape and murder of Jeanette Lawrence shattered the illusion that Madison was safe from the kind of crime that occurred in places like New York City. The police promised that the case would soon be solved. Jeanette's killer, they said, would be brought to justice. But as it turned out, that was a promise they were unable to keep. On Friday, the day after the murder, Madison's acting mayor, Frank F. Gibney, and the borough council 
directed Police Chief Johnson to arrest 14-year-old Francis Cluxon III on suspicion of the murder of Janet Lawrence. Lieutenant Ryan made the arrest, escorting the boy to police headquarters. After four hours of questioning, he was taken to the county jail in Morristown. There was no explanation for the arrest and no information released about what was said in the interrogation room. Chief Johnson wasn't talking to reporters, and neither was the mayor. When Supreme Court Justice Charles W. Parker asked Mayor Gibney what facts have come into your possession creating evident proof where presumption of guilt warrants this boy being held, the mayor seemed puzzled. We have hardly had time to come to a conclusion, he replied, and yet they had ordered the boy to be arrested. What was going on? After questioning Chief Johnson and the Morris County Sheriff, Ethelbert Byram, Judge Parker reached his own conclusion. He seemed to have been arrested without the slightest justification, he declared, and added as he granted bail, the boy's people are substantial citizens. From the start, investigators pursued what they regarded as the most significant clue. The cord that had been used to tie Janet's hands behind her back was the kind used by greenhouses to bind roses for shipment. Since the turn of the century, Madison had been known as the Rose Capital of America. There were a number of greenhouses in the community that specialized in roses and shipped them through the country. Now, detectives from Morris County and Newark began to question local greenhouse employees, including those at Barton's Greenhouse on Fairview Avenue, near the scene of the crime, and at Rosicka's in Florham Park. But there were also problems with the investigation from the beginning. No one from Madison had informed the Morris County prosecutor, John M. Mills, that Francis Cluxon was going to be arrested. After the borough council hastily demanded the arrest, with no evidence to support it, the prosecutor made his displeasure with the situation known. The resentment between officials in Morristown and Madison, caused by the council's actions, affected the entire investigation that followed. One result of this disagreement was a stubborn refusal by Mills to consider the idea that Francis could have been involved in the murder. He was fixated on finding a greenhouse employee who was near the scene of the crime, and he soon found one. Frank Janserek was 29 years old and the brother-in-law of Arthur Ruzicka, owner of the greenhouse in Florham Park. Frank had been working there for several years. Frank had come to the attention of detectives from the Morris County Prosecutor's Office, which highlights another problematic issue in that there were several different jurisdictions working the case, none of them cooperating with the others, because he'd been near Cluxon's woods around the time that Janet was murdered. That was the sole reason that he fell under suspicion. His explanation for being there seemed peculiar, but harmless. He said he had made an appointment to meet his brother, Jerry, who worked at the nearby Barton's Greenhouses at 5 p.m. at the corner of Ridgedale and Fairview Avenues. They were getting together so that Frank could tell him that day's score in the second game of the World Series between the New York Giants and New York Yankees. On his trip to meet his brother, Frank brought with him a New York newspaper containing an account of the game for which he'd had to wait at the Union Cigar Store in Madison until 5.20 p.m. That was when the latest edition of the paper was delivered. Now running late, he hurried down Central Avenue and arrived at the corner at 5.30 p.m. This was what put him at, or at least near, the scene of the murder. But it took a disgruntled, recently fired employee of Ruzicka's to get Frank into real trouble. The former worker, Frank McRory, was a mentally unstable ex-convict who claimed he met Janserek on the night of the murder and that Janserek had confessed to killing Jeanette. McGrory told his story to the police about three weeks after the murder. Frank admitted that he had seen McGrory that night but denied making any such confession. When the Morris County investigators found a dagger, it was actually a letter opener, in the bedroom of Frank's rooming house in Florham Park, he became the prime suspect. Later, two investigators from Newark found another knife, badly rusted, that McGrory claimed to have lent Frank on the morning of the murder and which he tossed off the Columbia Bridge that night. Now the prosecutor had two knives and a case built entirely on the testimony of an ex-convict with mental problems, 
and a grudge against the family of the man who was being accused of murder. What could go wrong? Meanwhile, the case against Francis Cluxon III had not gone away. Even though evidence against the 14-year-old boy was just as flimsy as that against Frank Chancerek, the Madison Borough Council and the local police were just as convinced that he was involved in the murder. He had been in trouble numerous times, and while that in itself did not make him a killer, they felt that it did make him a plausible suspect. The single-minded pursuit of separate suspects by the town and the county prevented any possible cooperation between the two authorities. Each was determined to make a case against their own suspect, and damn the consequences. On October 25th, Prosecutor John M. Mills ordered the arrest of Frank Janserek. Despite the protests of the Madison Borough Council, the scant evidence against him was presented to a grand jury in Morristown, starting on November 3rd. Justice Charles W. Parker supported the authority of the prosecutor, advising the grand jury that in a case of unlawful interference in the exercise of your functions, a prompt indictment of the offenders or offenders would be full justified. Judge Parker's warnings quieted the protests from the Borough Council for the time being. All the members of the Madison Borough Council were summoned before the grand jury, as well as Jeanette's neighbors, including Bertha Crane, the Friedlanders, and Mrs. Sant, whose child she had often cared for in the afternoons. Some of the evidence presented seemed to implicate Francis Cluxon rather than Frank Janserek, but Mills was not interested in seeking an indictment against the boy. His focus was on Frank, who allegedly had all but convicted himself of murder in the conversation with McGrory on the night of the murder, or so the ex-convict continued to claim. And the grand jury believed him. They indicted Frank Janserek on November 29th. Frank's trial was originally supposed to start on January 9th, but a series of delays moved it to April 3rd. Andrew Van Blarkham, a well-known Newark attorney, was hired to represent him. He was assisted by Joshua R. Salmon, a former Morris County judge. Van Blarkham promised to not only prove that his client was innocent, he would also expose the identity of the true killer. Although John Mills had planned to oversee the prosecution, he announced soon after Janserek's indictment that he would ask New Jersey Attorney General Thomas F. McCran to come to Morristown and present the state's case. McCran agreed to do so. Soon after, the Madison Borough Council decided to hire its own attorney, Robert H. McCarter, a former state attorney general, to counter the criticism that was being leveled against the council by both Mills and McCran. Much of that criticism had to do with a letter that Dr. G. A. Smith, superintendent of the New York State Hospital at Central Islip, Long Island, had sent to Madison's Chief Johnson. Dr. Smith stated that a patient in his hospital, Reuben Weiss, had talked in a raving manner about having murdered a young woman in Madison. Chief Johnson had filed the letter away and had forgotten about it. It was common to get such confessions in murder cases, he said. He didn't give this one any credence. It turned out that Johnson was right. Weiss knew nothing about the case other than what he had read in the newspaper. But the fact that Johnson withheld the letter because he didn't want to muddy the waters with another suspect drew the wrong kind of attention to the borough's council investigation. It was becoming obvious that somewhere along the way, authorities on both sides lost sight of the fact that a young girl had been murdered. The investigation had been deteriorated into two feuding camps, each trying to convince an improbable suspect while Janet's actual killer remained unpunished. Newspaper reporters covering Janserick's case clearly believed that he was being railroaded. They also took a dim view of the upscale treatment that was being given to witness Frank McCrory, who they noted was a star boarder at the country jail. The man has paid one dollar a day for his meals. McGrory has developed into a man about town at the county seat and is frequently seen at the moving pictures, wrestling matches, and other diversions. In contrast, Frank Janserek does not have things so easy. He's spending time in a cell that is said to be ill-ventilated. The place is dirty. Rats run over his bed during the night. The food is poor. Paper and trash are allowed to accumulate. 
The matter was taken up with Sheriff Byram, who said it was up to the keeper to see the man got the right treatment. Finally, six months after the murder and more than four months after he was indicted, Frank's trial got underway. A large crowd gathered at the courthouse at its start on April 3rd and grew larger with each of the eight days that followed. One of the most important early witnesses was H.G.A. Nilsson, who lived at 150 Ridgedale Avenue, a few houses away from the Lawrence family. He said that on the night of the murders he had arrived in Madison at 5.15 p.m., having taken a trolley home from Chatham, where he worked. He had walked from the trolley stop on Central Avenue toward his home, reaching the Lawrence home at 142 Ridgedale at about 5.40 p.m. There he saw Mrs. Lawrence and Janet standing in the yard talking. Nilsson also claimed that he saw Frank Janserek lurking nearby, trying to hide behind a bush. He had never seen Frank before, but he knew it was him because Sheriff Byram had sent him into a room where several men were lined up and asked him to pick out the one he had seen on October 6th. Before making his choice, Nilsson left the room and discussed the man's appearance with the sheriff. When the defense attorney asked him why he did this, he replied, I wanted to be sure. When Nilsson went back into the room, he pointed out Frank Janserek. Van Blarkham was obviously uncomfortable with the way that the identification was made. He asked Nilsson, didn't you pick out the man in your mind and then change your mind after talking to the sheriff? No, never, Nilsson said. The issue is that Frank's presence on Ridgedale Avenue that night was never in question. He admitted to being there, planning to meet his brother to deliver the news about the World Series game. But why was he hiding behind a bush? It's unlikely that he was. Nilsson also claimed he saw Jeanette talking to her mother in front of the Lawrence house, but Janet never made it home that night. Nilsson likely mixed at least two different nights together in his mind and then recalled them as happening the same evening. Or he was lying, which is another very strong possibility. Whichever it was, no one called him on it and the testimony was allowed to stand. On the sixth day of the trial, Frank Janserek took the witness stand. He offered a chronology for himself in great detail about the day of the murder. Yes, he was near the Cluxon's woods around the presumed time of the murder, but he was never in the woods. Yes, he had seen Frank McGrory as he was walking home. He knew him from working at Rosica's. According to Janserek, he ran into him on South Orange Avenue. When McGrory told him he'd had nothing to eat all day, Janserek invited him to come home and have supper with him and his mother, which McGrory did. Afterwards, the two of them had walked toward the Columbia Bridge to see if work was being done on it. If it was, a construction job might be available for McGrory, who had recently been fired. On the way back, they saw a car that had gone into a ditch. They helped the owner get it back on the road. Returning to the Janserek house, McGrory retrieved a coat that he left there. Janserek then accompanied McGrory to a nearby shed where the ex-convict had been sleeping. He left him at the shed and went home. Frank insisted that they'd had no discussion about any rape or murder. There have been monsters among us lurking in the darkest corners of America, preying on children since the first settlers arrived on our shores. They've always been with us, stalking the innocent from the days of the original colonies to the Gilded Age, the Depression, and beyond. These monsters are not the stuff of fiction. They are blood-curdlingly real, and they still walk among us, always looking for their next victim. In the chilling book Suffer the Children, Troy Taylor shines a light on the darkest tales of horror and hauntings from American history and presents a terrifying collection of dark crimes perpetrated against our most tender victims, our children. His most disturbing book yet includes nightmarish tales from the 19th century, when the good old days were never good. Like The Monster of the North Wood, The Pocasset Horror, and The Girl in the Cellar, and continues into the modern day with accounts of The Cluxon Woods, America's first school massacre, Wineville chicken coop murders, Babes of Inglewood, Suzanne Degnan, 
the Girl Scout Camp Massacre, the perfect murder of Bobby Franks, and many more. Be warned, this is not a book for the faint of heart. These are tales containing brutal, agonizing, and terrifying scenes of horror. Suffer the Children, American Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings, Dead Men Do Tell Tale Series Book 15 by Troy Taylor. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Archives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. The prosecution then went after the small amount of physical evidence that had been recovered. The letter opener from Frank's bedroom as turned over to Dr. Albert Edel, a chemist in Newark, to test for bloodstains. Edel was a German immigrant and graduate to the University of Berlin. He testified that he had performed such tests 12 times in the 22 years he had been in the United States. He found no bloodstains on the blade, but when he pried off the handle, he found human blood stains on the metal and wooden parts of the letter opener. But whose blood? There was no way to know. Those kinds of tests wouldn't be available for many decades to come. Dr. Edel was also given hair from both Jeanette and Frank Janserek. Detectives also gave him the sweater that Janet had been wearing when she was killed. He found 12 hairs on it, and one of them was not hers. He testified that the one hair closely resembled Janserek's in color and texture, but of course he could not say absolutely that it was his. In any event, Dr. Edel had thrown the hairs away. He did have a slide that illustrated his comparison, but the actual evidence was gone. When defense attorney Joshua Salman later summarized the case, he was particularly brutal with Dr. Edel and his evidence. He urged the jury that they should disregard anything the German doctor had to say simply because he was German. The trial took place in 1922, just four years after the end of World War I, and it was considered patriotic at the time to ridicule anything or anyone who was German, since they had been America's enemy such a short time before. In addition to casting suspicion on Francis Kluxen because his ancestors came from Germany, they also introduced theories and evidence that looked bad for Kluxen. When Van Blarkham was cross-examining Chief Johnson, he was asked about the footprint measurements that were taken at the scene of the crime. They were found all around the tree stump near where Janet's body had been found, and a trail led away from there to a water hydrant. Detectives surmised that the killer might have washed off blood from the murder there, Johnson had compared them with shoes taken from both prime suspects in the murder and had found a match. "'Where did you get the shoes?' Van Blarkham asked, referring to the ones that matched the size of the tracks found in the woods. "'At the Kluxen house,' Johnson replied. Later in the trial, Kate Kluxen was called to the stand by the prosecution, perhaps to bolster her son's testimony, which had been mercilessly shredded by the defense. During his cross-examination, Van Blarkham noted that on the night of the murder, Mrs. Kluxen had placed her son's trousers in a pail of water to soak. She said this was because his pants often got stained when he worked on the wine press. Did you ever find it necessary to put Francis' trousers in to soak before? Van Blarkham questioned her. Mrs. Kluxen paused before she answered. No, they were never before stained to the extent they were that night. A long line of defense witnesses testified as to the good character of Frank Janserek. Even Sheriff Byram, a prosecution witness, acknowledged that Frank had good qualities. A while back, in a rape case in Somerville, Frank had assisted the police in their investigation of the crime and had testified for the state. He was a solid citizen 
a hard worker from a good family who owned a local business, and he had never been in trouble with the law. He was, some surmised, simply in the wrong place at the wrong time and fell under suspicion. Frank McGrory, Jansarek's chief accuser, was another story. While a few regarded the former inmate as rational and believable, a greater number described him as mentally unhinged. Witnesses described a lot of bizarre behavior – throwing chairs, offering apples to imaginary people, speaking to imaginary people in the greenhouse before he was fired, and even wailing fits that stretched out for minutes at a time. When questioned, McGrory denied that he had been promised a reward or a job for helping to convict Jansarek, although he admitted that he knew a reward had been offered. It took the jury less than an hour to find Frank Jansarek not guilty of the murder of Janet Lawrence. The newspapers widely reported the story. Most reporters didn't believe him guilty anyway, but asked the question that everyone wanted an answer for. If not Jansarek, then who killed Jeanette? It was widely believed that Prosecutor Mills, aided by Attorney General McCran, had gone after the wrong man. Locals wanted the real killer brought to justice, Francis Cluxon III, and they didn't want John Mills or Thomas McCran to be involved in the case. Mills was happy to excuse himself from further participation, but McCran argued that he was, then as I am now, in complete charge of the matter for the state. This announcement came in response to a letter from Robert H. McCarter, the attorney for the Madison Borough Council, who called on McCran to recuse himself because of his zealous prosecution of Frank Jansarek. As McCarter noted, "...necessarily deprives you of the influence you should have in laying any further evidence that may be presented before the grand jury." McCran wasn't swayed by the valid argument against him and in May appeared before a grand jury in Morristown to present evidence in the case. This move caught McCarter and the borough council by surprise. McCarter had not yet prepared a response to McCran's last statement, and yet the Attorney General was trying for a new indictment. Several witnesses appeared before the grand jury, including Chief Johnson. As far as anyone knew, there was no remaining suspect in the murder, except for Francis Cluxon. On Friday, June 2nd, the teenager was indicted for murder, and he was immediately taken back into custody. He was placed in the same cell that Frank Jansarek had occupied for five months. Cluxon's attorney, Elmer King, moved to quash the indictment on the grounds that his client had been a witness at Jansarek's trial, but Judge Charles Parker denied the motion. Francis entered a not guilty plea. At this point, McCran decided that he didn't want to act as a prosecutor in the new trial, so Judge Parker picked J. Henry Harrison of Newark, a former Essex County prosecutor, to conduct the state's case. The Madison Borough Council had gotten what it wanted, a trial with a new special prosecutor, but did any more evidence exist against Cluxon than there had been against Frank Jansarek? On the surface, the evidence looked just as weak and circumstantial. Cluxon was in the vicinity at the time of the murder, and he owned a Boy Scout knife that could have been used as the murder weapon. He also had access to the same kind of cord that had been used to bind Jeanette since the Cluxon Winery also used the same kind of cord that the local greenhouses did. So what then was new in this case, other than the fact that Jansarek had a good reputation in the community while Francis was considered a troublemaker by those who knew him? Rumors claimed that the evidence that Attorney General McCran had presented to the grand jury was much more detailed and persuasive than what Mills had presented against Jansarek the previous autumn. Many people in Madison believed Janet's murder was just about to be solved. Unfortunately, they couldn't have been more wrong. Convicting Francis Cluxon III was not going to be easy. Legal maneuvering by Elmer King started before the trial date was even set. He convinced the justices on the New Jersey Supreme Court that a change of venue was needed. An impartial jury could not be drawn from Morris County, he stated, Public opinion was so strong in the Madison area that his client would not be able to get a fair trial. For that reason, it was moved to Morristown and the jury would be selected from Essex County. The trial began in July, and King, just as Jansarek's attorneys had done with Cluxon, tried hard to implicate Jansarek in Janet's murder. 
many of the same witnesses appeared, telling the same stories they had already told. One major difference in this trial was that there was no purported confession. Cluxon, now 15 and large for his age, 6 feet 2 inches tall and 170 pounds, denied that he had seen Jeanette on the day of the murder. On the morning of October 6th, he told the jury that he had worked in the winery until 12.30 p.m. and had badly stained his trousers with grape juice. Ordinarily, he would have been in school that day, but he had recently been expelled from St. Vincent's parochial school in Madison. The principal noted that his behavior was abnormal and his behavior was too troubling for the nuns to handle. During the previous summer, he had been sent home from Boy Scout summer camp for repeatedly breaking the rules. At the time of his trial, he was still waiting to be enrolled at a boarding school in Baltimore. Cluxon testified that he knew Jeanette only slightly, having skated with her on a nearby pond during the winter, but he had never played with her. However, several people who knew both children disputed this claim. One of them, Mrs. Sadie Miller, a neighbor to both, recalled that she once heard Jeanette screaming and going out of her home to see what was wrong found Francis with one arm raised, apparently throwing something away. Jeanette complained to Sadie that the boy was always bothering her. She testified that Francis yelled at Sadie, "'Damn you! I'll get you yet!' Joseph Luciano, another neighbor, reported that he had once seen Jeanette and Francis near a shed on Ridgedale Avenue. They were yelling at each other. When Luciano walked over to see what was going on, he heard Jeanette cry, "'Let me go!' When he reached the scene, Cluxon quickly left. Whatever the relationship had been between the two of them, the newspapers reported that Cluxon accounted for nearly every minute of his time on the day of the murder. He explained that, in the afternoon, he had gone to the train station and back in his uncle's truck, how he had gone for a ride in a pony cart with his cousins, and how he had walked in Cluxon Woods with 14-year-old Anna Nilsson showing her where he had fired a 22 caliber bullet into a tree while trying to shoot a squirrel. After Anna left, he went home, carrying two bottles of milk he'd bought. When he got there, he discovered that his pet rabbit had escaped. He sent his dog Brownie in search of the rabbit, but Brownie, instead of chasing the rabbit, went off after a neighbor's cat. Francis then had to chase the rabbit and the dog through the woods, which was how he accounted for his footprints being found at the tree stump and the fire hydrant. He claimed that, sweaty from the pursuit, he opened the water hydrant to get a drink of water and rinse his hands and face. Prosecutor Harrison pointed out that if Cluxon had spent much time walking and running around in the woods so close to the time of the murder, then he must have seen something. How could he have no idea about what had happened there? But the defendant insisted that he had seen nothing. During his testimony, Francis did admit that he regularly carried a Boy Scout knife on his belt. He also agreed that his mother had placed his badly stained trousers in a bucket of water to soak, but he insisted they were stained with grape juice, not blood. The most damaging testimony concerned two handkerchiefs that were found at the crime scene. One of them was wrapped around Jeanette's neck. The other, bearing the initial F, was stuffed into the tam-o'-shanter, traditional beret-like Scottish hat, that she'd been wearing. Both handkerchiefs had been mended in a similar manner. More than a month after the murder, investigators removed five handkerchiefs from a cabinet in a hallway outside of Francis's bedroom. These five handkerchiefs had all been mended in the same way as the ones from the crime scene. All seven were put into evidence, and the prosecution called Mrs. Mary C. Brower, a teacher of sewing and dressmaking, to testify about the mending that had been done to them. Mrs. Bauer testified that the mending was all the work of one person, using the same technique. In addition, they had used the same thread in all seven, which was noteworthy because it was too coarse for the job. This was damaging testimony, but didn't actually prove anything. It was circumstantial, just like the rest of the evidence against Cluxon. No one had seen the murder committed. No one could even say that he was nearby when Jeanette was killed. Francis Cluxon may have been disliked by neighbors, but did that make him a murderer? The jury didn't think so, or at least they didn't think that anyone had proved it. They deliberated for three hours before returning with the second not-guilty verdict in the same murder case. 
Pluxen appeared calm when the verdict was read, although his parents had fidgeted nervously. They took their son home to the house on Fairview Avenue. The Cluxon name had been sullied, but it was not damaged beyond repair. Two acquittals in two different Jeanette Lawrence murder trials raised serious questions about the way the case had been investigated in the first place. The crime hardly seemed beyond solution. The Madison Borough Council thought the killer was easily identified, but the case had not been solved to the satisfaction of two trial juries. And it would never be solved. Frank Janserek left Madison soon after his trial. He moved to Johnson City, Tennessee, married a girl named Blen Duke Bryant, and had two sons and four daughters with her. He worked for many years at the Johnson City Foundry, attended the Methodist Church, and lived a quiet, peaceful life. He passed away in 1979. Francis Cluxon III, however, made plenty of newspaper headlines in the 1920s and 1930s. His next appearance in the papers involved his bizarre adoption in Orphan's Court. A wealthy and highly respected 48-year-old bachelor, Manel Sayer, who lived in a grand mansion in Convent, had taken a liking to the boy during his murder trial. Sayer found Francis to have such winning and upright qualities that he proposed taking him under his wing and making him his legal heir. Yes, this is all as strange as it sounds. Sayer was an esteemed resident of the region. His ancestors had settled in Morris County in 1665, and Sayer himself had been born two centuries later in 1875. He graduated from Harvard in 1898 and taught history at Columbia University. He left Columbia to become a staff member of the Carnegie Foundation, specializing in pensions, and worked closely with Andrew Carnegie in several ventures. Sayer was a lifelong Episcopalian and held many high positions in the church, most notably as the founder and administrator of the Church Pension Fund for the National Church Organization. He was considered the father of the church pension system and helped establish the pension fund for the clergy of the Church of England at the invitation of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Sayer was also active in democratic politics. He ran unsuccessfully for the House of Representatives from New Jersey in 1922, 1924, and 1932. To put it simply, Manel Sayer was an imposing presence in New Jersey. His plan to adopt Francis and make him his ward might have seemed very odd to people, but no one was going to say much about it. Publicly, at least. The whole thing was peculiar. Francis had just been acquitted of murder, and his parents had stood solidly behind him throughout his entire ordeal. His mother had wept unrestrainedly when the verdict was announced. And yes, five months later, the respected and well-to-do parents were ready to turn their son over to a middle-aged bachelor who had become acquainted with the boy only because he was on trial for murder. The upside was that Francis would soon become the sole heir to an enormous fortune. Was this the reason his parents went along with this weird and rather unsettling scheme? Or had they finally had their fill of the trouble that Francis was repeatedly getting himself into? More importantly, did they believe that their son had committed murder? Perhaps and perhaps they believed that Sayer's wealth would keep him from falling under suspicion the next time that a young girl was found dead in the woods. In Orphan's Court, Cluxon's father testified that the expenses of the murder trial had drained his resources and made him amendable to the idea of the boy's adoption by a man of wealth and position. His mother agreed, but wanted to make it clear to the court that her son's adopted name would be Francis Cluxon Sayer a last vestige of the family from which he had sprung. Whoever it was on the Madison Borough Council that was quick to suspect Francis of murder would likely have predicted that the relationship between the boy and Manel Sayer would be an uneasy one. They could have pointed to an incident in 1923 as proof of this. Just before Christmas, Sayer brought Francis, now 16, to a service at the Grace Episcopal Church in Madison. The rector, Rev. Victor W. Morai, along with most of his congregation, who believed the boy had not only gotten away with murder but was now living in a situation that was questionable at best, were outraged by the appearance of Sayer and his companion. He left the church and even moved out of the area to Princeton, 
This move indicated the seriousness of Sayre's problem, for his family had been the leading citizens of Morris County for 250 years. But the locals were angry over the situation he had created in ways that he had not expected. Sayre's life and career were permanently and adversely affected by his association with the boy whose winning and upright qualities had so impressed him during the trial. Francis took advantage of the older man and disregarded any feelings that Sayer had for him. In 1926, he left Sayer's house and a year or so later enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps in Portland, Oregon. Although he rose to the rank of first lieutenant and re-enlisted in 1931, he won no awards for distinguished service. On Christmas Day 1932, he attacked two men in San Diego with a meat cleaver during a robbery. Both men were badly hurt but survived. Francis was given a suspended sentence and fined $50. In June 1930, he shot and killed an African-American man named Joe Hullman in San Diego. According to the story, Francis told the police Hullman, who lived next door, had been drinking with him, another man, and a woman earlier in the evening. When Hullman became drunk and abusive, he was asked to leave. He did, but soon returned with a gun, which he pointed at Francis' friend, Douglas Mathewson, and Mrs. Ruth Foster, who owned the boarding house where he lived. Francis, who was out of the room at the time, slipped upstairs, grabbed a shotgun, came back down, and shot Hallman dead. A coroner's jury found that Francis had killed Hallman in self-defense. In April 1934, he was arrested again in San Diego. He was accused of committing nine burglaries in the city and county. Also charged with him was Ruth Foster, the woman that he had saved from Hallman the previous year. The two of them were living together in a fashionable section of San Diego at the time of their arrest. Police found dozens of rifles, shotguns, and pistols in a house, plus a stock of ammunition and more than $1,000 in loot. This time, Francis' rap sheet and the physical evidence caught up with him. He was convicted and sentenced to serve up to 14 years at San Quentin. During the trial, he married his accomplice, who only ended up with probation. Not surprisingly, the marriage didn't work out, and some time later he married again. When he died on April 15, 1971, his obituary noted that he was survived by his wife Thelma and his daughter Evelyn. Four decades before his death, Francis had become estranged from Manel Sayer. The reason for the split is unknown, but Francis did continue to use the surname Sayer for the rest of his life. It probably didn't matter much to Manel Sayer, though. He died unexpectedly at the Lafayette Hotel in Washington, D.C. on June 15, 1936. Whatever became of his estate seems to be a mystery. It's apparent from his lifestyle that Francis didn't inherit the wealth that he likely expected when Sayer adopted him. I've been unable to discover what might have happened to all the money. The Cluxon Winery, freed from its connection to the boy that everyone in town believed was a murderer, continued to prosper. It finally came to an end in 1973, and the buildings were torn down. There is nothing that remains of the winery today. Cluxon's woods have been replaced by homes, and there are no reminders today of what occurred along those quiet streets. But there are stories. After the crumbling ruins of the winery were torn down in the 1970s, houses were built on the land that it once occupied. The site where Jeanette was murdered and her body was found is now someone's backyard. Rumors spread that the area was haunted. Were they merely stories created because of a murder that had occurred more than 50 years earlier? Believe it or not, that seems unlikely. One of the families that moved into a new home was from outside the area. They knew nothing of Jeanette's murder, and yet one of the children began reporting the ghost of a young girl who appeared in his room. She was thin, he said, and tall with light brown hair, a description that certainly matches that of Jeanette Lawrence. But more common were the stories that have continued for years, that motorists were spotting Jeanette's apparition on Fairfield or Ridgedale Avenues walking down the street, trying to make her way home from her babysitting job. 
just as she did on that cool night in October 1921. Of course, Jeanette never made it, and the stories say neither does her ghost. Some of those who have seen her say that she vanishes when the headlights of their car illuminate her figure. She is recognizable, they say she's thin, has brown hair, and is wearing an old-fashioned skirt, coat, and a hat that looks like a beret. It's not the usual clothing that children in the neighborhood wear, which is usually what gets their attention. As the car approaches, she disappears. Could this be the ghost of Jeanette Lawrence, still walking the streets of the place where she once lived and unable to rest after a murder that has never been solved? It just might be. But until the day when she decides to speak to those passing motorists who see the girl by the side of the road, we'll never know for sure. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Murder at Cluxton's Woods is from the audiobook Suffer the Children, American Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings by Troy Taylor. I've narrated the entire audiobook, and you can find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I've also placed a link to it in the episode description. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And a final thought. You can in no manner be satisfied with temporal goods, for you were not created to find your rest in them. Thomas Akempis I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.